it was a different kind of Passover, to say the least. Um, I remember right when we sat down, Philip leaned over to me and he whispers, Hey, Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. <laughs> I looked at him. I said, I doubt it. I was wrong. <laughs> Jesus got up from the table. He, he walked over and grabbed a basin of water and a towel. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, what's Jesus doing with the foot water? You know, I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. He, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange, yet wonderful. And then I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. You know who broke the silence. Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you're not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch. Okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. And he looked at me and said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine. He blessed it and he served it to us. He said it was uh, a new covenant with his blood. And he said, um, tonight all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there, I had to say something, so I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you, you can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, Peter, you'll deny me three times for tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray. Once we got to the garden, um, it's, it just got crazy. Um, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in the garden with him and pray, and we did. We tried. We kept falling asleep. Um, Jesus kept waking us up. I remember one time he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all a blur. Uh, <laughs> I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon. 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. The one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend? Uh, and then it, it got crazy. Uh, Peter, <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he, he cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus, Jesus reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then, um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him, but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that... I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus.
I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. It didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotting in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, and that was it. So the guards, they came and got me and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're gonna say, let Jesus go. And then I was gonna tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting, Barabbas. I mean, I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd and they, and they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, I mean one minute I, I am a man marked for death and then the next I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man, hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath and he said, it is finished. And then he died. Surely. This man was the son of God. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Food for thought. What a get you to think about a word that came at the end of our second reading, the word ransom, at the end of the song, rather. He's paid my ransom. Have you ever been ransomed? It might have not been in the sense of being 
held a prisoner or a hostage and some great amount of money paid to free you. It may simply be that the policeman lets you off with a warning. Uh, children are regularly ransomed. We can ransom others, letting them free from that which we would hold against them. It's a central idea in the Christian faith. This idea of forgiveness, and that's tied in with ransom, in the place of love. In a few weeks' time, we're going to observe Anzac Day. In many ways, that can be seen as a day of ransom, when we as a nation acknowledge a price that was paid to free us, to give us a life that we enjoy today. But one of the important things with the ransom is what are you going to do with the life that you now get? That was the issue for Barabbas, wasn't it? In that video. He was ransomed that day. What was he going to do now with his life? Go back to old ways or come to some new ways? Over the last 40 days, we have been spending time in the journey of Lent, in prayer, in Bible reading, in reflecting on how we live our life, how we live out our ransomed life. How do we live out this life that we have been given in Christ Jesus? Today is a day when we ponder that more deeply. Each of us will give our own answer. There is no one answer to that, for all our lives are different. But we all are called to respond to Christ to decide that very ancient question that goes all the way back into the Old Testament where God calls, are you for me or are you against me? To be a ransom people is to be a people who are for Christ. And that means standing up for Christ and saying, no, this man has given his life for me I will give my life for him. That was the challenge of the disciples. After they had all run away, and you saw that sense of shame that they experienced, that they weren't willing at that time to stand up for Christ. But of course, those same disciples that abandoned Jesus came to be radically transformed in the following weeks. They came to receive a power from above that would transform the kind of character that they were and how they would live out their life. We go on that same journey as we come to the cross, as we acknowledge our ransomed life as we journey through Easter and on through the season of Easter, arriving ultimately at Pentecost. For today is but one day on a journey that we make through this time of year, this holy season. Lent is not the end of it, but a pause along the way to remember and celebrate the great love of God shown in Christ Jesus. It's been said that you can only do two things with love. Embrace it or push it away. Humanity, by nature, tends to push it away. No, God, I want to do things my way. In the cross, we embrace the love of God. We embrace that which touches our very soul and seek his help, his encouragement, his guidance to live out our ransom lives. I trust all of you have received one of these nails. If you haven't, please indicate because we need everybody to have one. 
And in a little while, you're going to be invited to come forward. For we come now to the proclamation of the cross, but it will be introduced with the time of silence. And for this time, notwithstanding knee replacement surgery, we kneel. <laughs> 